Revelation chapter 21 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, and unbelieving, and abominable, and murders, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, shall have their part in the lake of fire which burneth with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. And there came unto me one of the seven angels that had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will shew thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in spirit to a great and high mountain, and shewed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal, and had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and the gates had twelve pearls, the names written thereon, which were the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. I'd like to read a little bit more of that here in a minute. But first I just wanted to say that I'm one of these people that you will often be warned against uh, by many in the religious establishment, many in the newspaper establishment in the media I'm one of these people that are foolish enough to take the Word of God literally having said that I understand full well that there are symbolic things in the Bible there are things especially in apocalyptic revelatory prophetic literature such as the book of Revelation that is symbolic I understand that but I believe that these symbols mean something real that these symbols mean something concrete. I tend to take the book of Revelation literally. I understand that there are uh, things in the book of Revelation that you cannot take literally, such as the descriptions of maybe the locusts and the judgment that's going to be passed down uh, that are going to be let loose. Perhaps they're invisible demonic beings. I don't think that they're going to be liter um, literally these monsters roaming all over the countryside. Who knows? Maybe. But at the same time, I was reading in a book today. Uh, I don't re recall the name of the author. But he called himself uh, the Bible Answer Man or something like that. And he had some pretty good answers for some questions, and it looked like he he thought it out. Uh, he thought very carefully before he wrote and researched the passages in Scripture concerning the things that he wanted to talk about. And then we started to get into the end times things and uh, certain other things. I'm reading it, and I, I'm starting to scratch my head because he started to talk about the book of Revelation was written, according to him, before the temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. He denied the 90-95 A.D. date that uh, most other scholars put on the book of Revelation. And then I realized, oh, okay, this guy is what's called a preterist or a partial preterist, meaning that he believes that the Bible was completed in um, the 60s shortly after Paul wrote his last epistle, 
according to the partial pregress, the book of Revelation was written. Now, this denies a lot of things, and there's a lot of reasons why they want to put the book of Revelation at that date. Because they want to say that everything in the scripture was fulfilled in the first century, that there is no future fulfillment coming for the people of God. Now, the partial preterists don't go that far. They say that everything with the exception of the return of Jesus Christ uh, has been fulfilled. They deny the doctrine of the rapture. That is, they deny that Jesus Christ is going to come and take his church before what's called the tribulation. They deny um, much of what's... Uh, much of what would the future say has yet to happen. They say that it all happened in the first century. And then there's the uh, group that are part preterist, part historicist that says that it's all been fulfilled, but it has all been fulfilled through history. I disagree. What I just read to you has not happened in time and space. At no point in time has ever a city called New Jerusalem come down from heaven. There is no new heaven, new earth having been created yet. This is why the partial preachers say, well, that hasn't happened, but everything else has. I disagree with them also. I do believe that Jesus Christ is coming back for his church. I do believe there is something called the tribulation. I do believe that much of the popular notions of futurism that has been put out in the public arena recently with the Left Behind novels and Hal Lindsey's books, I think those things can withstand closer examination and criticism. But by and large, I still consider myself a futurist. I still consider myself someone who believes that the events recorded in the book of Revelation uh, parts of the book of Daniel, parts of the book of Isaiah, Zechariah. I believe these things have yet a future fulfillment. And here in the book of Revelation, as we look into the chapter 20, 21, 22, we see that after the culmination of all things, there's a new heaven and a new earth. It says in the book of Isaiah, Behold, I create everything new. And the old things shall not even come into mind. And when it says in the book of Isaiah that God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth, and then here in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. That to me is exciting. I'm not looking forward to the destruction, the, the pain, the things that... I believe the Bible says is going to come upon the earth. In fact, may have already may have already started in many respects. Even though the rapture hasn't happened, uh, that is to say, the catching away of the church is spoken of in the book of Thessalonians. The resurrection is not past. The resurrection is not over. There is coming a resurrection when Jesus Christ returns for His church. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, said the Apostle Paul in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he says that we should not sorrow as others that have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again, even so those who have died in Christ, those who sleep in Christ, as it's put in Thessalonians, shall he bring with them, with him. He's bringing them with him, therefore they're coming back with him. But it says that we shall meet them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We shall receive new bodies, the Bible tells us, made like Jesus Christ's body. The book of 1 John chapter 3 tells us, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. It goes on to tell us that we do not know what we shall be, but we do know that when he, Jesus, appears, we shall be made like him, for we shall see him as he is. 
these passages tell me that we are going to get new bodies. And that makes sense to me if we're going to be living in a new heaven and a new earth. That makes sense to me if we're going to be living in the city of God with God himself. That makes sense to me if we are going to be with Jesus Christ, beholding him face to face. We would have to. These bodies were not meant to last forever. Well, actually, some would say when God made Adam, he did intend Adam to live forever. But Adam fell. And in falling and bringing sin and rebelling against God, he brought disease. He brought death. He brought pain upon these human bodies. And when Jesus Christ suffered the penalty for that sin and all the other sins upon the cross, we see that Jesus Christ, after his resurrection, did not come back in the same body quite that he had, or should I say quite the same body that he had before the crucifixion. No, he got a new body, a body in power, the Bible says. It was, it was laid into the grave in weakness, but it was raised in power. And we also will have such bodies when we see Jesus Christ. I believe at the point called the rapture, the catching away, we shall not, you know, we shall all be caught up. The Greek word there is harpazo, which is translated into the Latin Vulgate raptos, which is where we get the English word rapture. When Jesus Christ returns for his church, and he brings them to himself and raises those who have died in Christ and raises them up. He's raising up new bodies for them and their bodies and their souls are going to be reunited. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. And we shall be changed in the twinkling of an eye, as I have already said in the book of, in, pardon me, in the book of first, uh, first Corinthians. Now, without getting into the tribulation period, without getting into the overall futurist understanding of much of the book of Revelation, I want to look at heaven again. A few weeks ago, I started, uh, I looked at heaven. I want to continue looking at heaven because I've been thinking a lot about it. I've been thinking about that new body. I've been thinking about that new world. I've been thinking about that beholding my Savior who loved me so much that he took everything that I did wrong upon himself and died a punishment I deserved. He was separated from his Father in those hours on the cross, something that had never happened before. He had never been separated from his Father, and he experienced that. He endured the cross despising the shame. Why? Because he, for the joy that was set before him, the book of Hebrews says, he endured this. What was that joy set before him? He did it for you. He did it for me. He did it so that we could be with him in heaven, in this new heaven, in this new earth, in this place called New Jerusalem, the city of God. Now, I understand that the critics of the idea of heaven often point to the book written by Augustine called The City of God, in which he likened Rome with New Jerusalem. There's a problem with that. The book of Revelation was written well over 200 years before Augustine was born. The book of Revelation was written long before he came on the scene. The book of Revelation was written long before any, any major Christian center in Rome could claim to be the Christian center of the world. In fact, that didn't happen until Constantine in 320 or so. And Revelation was written in 90. So, I do not believe when the critics of heaven point to that, I don't think that they have a legitimate argument. You see, I'm looking forward to going to be with this place, to, uh, to going to be with Jesus in this place. I'm looking forward to being with the one who washed me from my sins in his own blood. Because I understand that, what did I just read? I read that God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. 
and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. All of those things, death, crying, tears, and pain, the part of our daily order now. I, I, I almost can't even imagine a world without death. I almost can't even imagine a world without pain and crying. But my God tells me that this is a reality. And it's a reality that he is preparing for me because he loves me. Why wouldn't I want to go to be with him? Why would I want to continue on in this world? Why would I want to see things continue the way they are? Things are not getting better in this world. And please don't understand what I'm saying as I'm trying to say that I have this idea that escapism is um, what I'm aiming for here. I'm not escaping into fantasy. I'm holding on to a promise that my God has made to me and to all those who call upon his name. I'm looking forward to a new body that is not racked by sin, disease, pain. I'm looking forward to living life without these things. I'm looking forward to being able to hear without all these ringing in my ears that I have all the time. Even if we don't have what you know, seems to be described as superpowers in our new bodies. Just the fact that I won't need glasses and I'll be able to hear. And I won't have the misunderstanding that is so often part of life. That to me sounds so much worth it. The first earth and the first heaven are passed away. And the former order of things, it says... For the former order of things are passed away. And it says sorrow, tears, crying, pain, death. Those are the former order. That's, that's our daily life now. When we turn on the news, we see the race, race riots going on in our country right now. We see that there's so much pain and confusion and war in this world. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And we can also see that no matter how hard that we are trying to be that peacemaker that Jesus said, there is no peace in this world outside of Jesus Christ himself. And because we know that this entire world is rejecting Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, there will be no earthly peace until he comes and physically sets it up himself. That doesn't mean that we don't continue to try. That doesn't mean that we don't continue to be that peacemaker that he has called us all to be. But it does mean that we need to realize that there is no peace outside of him. And there will be no permanent lasting peace in this world until those former things, until that former order has passed away. And it says that, talking about the angel that, that carried John away, and he showed me the holy city, New Jerusalem, descending out of, out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, and her light was like a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal. And I already read about the, the foundations and the, and, the, and the gates made of, you know, pearls or pearlescent material, maybe not necessarily pearls, but material that, that has an inner fire like pearls. The thing that strikes me about the gem stones that I just read is the, the beauty of them and the endurance of them. But one thing that seems striking, especially about Jasper Stone, is that when there's a light source, it looks like that light is emanating from it. The light and the glory of God is shining through these things. And it goes on to say, And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof. And the city lies four square, and the length is as large as the breadth, and the height of it are equal. You get the idea of a cube. 
And when it gives the measurements here, to put it in just modern English here, uh, well, I'll, well, I'll go ahead and read what it says. And the length and the breadth of it are equal. And he measured the wall thereof in 144 cubits, according to the measure of the man. That's over 200 feet tall. That's the wall. That's how high the wall is. And the building of the wall was Jasper City, was pure gold, like clear glass. I think I said this in my last, uh, my other video that I did on heaven, that when all impurities are taken out of gold, chemists tell us that gold here on earth now, if we were able to remove every bit of impurity out of it, would be clear like glass. There is no impurity in heaven. Gold speaks about God's mag uh, majesty and his royalty, and it is everywhere in heaven. And it's pure. There is no impurities at all in it. How in the world would the Apostle John know that pure, real, true, pure gold is clear like glass? I believe it's because he saw it. I believe it's because he actually saw this new city, New Jerusalem. And I believe it's a real place. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. And it goes on to mention those stones. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, and every other gate was one pearl. And the street of that city was pure glass, or pure gold as it was transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, nor the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. That's a very interesting statement, that the glory of God lights the city, and the Lamb is the light of that city. Why is that interesting? Because the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus Christ is the express image of God, and the shining of God's glory. Jesus is the very shining of God's glory. And the book of Revelation also says that very same thing. I just read it. And the nations of them which are saved will walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory into it. And the gates of it will not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And there shall no wise enter, it, enter into it anything that defiles, neither whatsoever that works abomination or makes a lie, but they that are written in the Lamb's book of life. I'm pausing here because I'm trying to read. North Three Gates. Oh yes, it's right here. And the city lies four square in length, and the length is as large as the breadth, and the height are equal. And he measured the city, it, and the city is twelve thousand. Pardon me, twelve thousand. Furlongs. As I was going to say, into in today's modern English, that's about that's over a thousand uh, five hundred miles. This is a huge city, people. One thousand five hundred miles in every direction. Critics of this idea say that no, that's symbolic. That that city couldn't possibly be that big. How could something made of gold and, and those gems like that, something that big, it would never be able to fit on this earth. It would never, it would crush the earth. That's why it's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Because the Bible doesn't say that New Jerusalem is going to sit on the earth as it is now. It's not going to sit on this earth as it is now, but it will sit on the earth when it's remade. When this city comes out of heaven proper, I don't know what else to call it, but that place where it is now, and God puts it here on the earth, it's going to be able to sit just fine, because God is going to recreate everything.
Let's look at uh, Revelation chapter 22. And if I'm not mistaken, I think I, I read a little bit of this in the last video I did about heaven. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him, and they will see his face. That is what I'm looking for. Of all the things that make heaven so attractive, and sets that longing fire in my heart the most, here it is. I want to see, I actually want to see Jesus Christ. I want to hear his voice, the tonal quality of his voice. I want to feel the touch of his hand. And I believe that I shall. I believe that when I enter into this place that I'm reading to you, that I'm talking about here, that I'm going to see him and he's going to speak to me. Perhaps all the things that he wanted to say to me, if I was just a little more willing to listen to him instead of talk so much when I pray. If I was willing a little more to dig a little deeper into his Bible, he would have been speaking to me so much already had I been more willing to listen, had I just slowed down a little bit. But the fact is, this is going to be an eternal thing. I'm going to be with him forever. I'm going to be with the one who loves me more than I can fathom. I am not going to disappoint him, nor be disappointed by anything. I am so looking forward to that. There will be no more curse but the throne of God. Everything that we do now in this world is touched by the curse. No matter how much we love what we do, it is still touched by the curse that we are all under. Oh, the curse has been broken in Jesus Christ's body on the tree. But until the fullness of our redemption, we still have to deal with that curse. We still live in a world that is rejecting this God. And until that, that is changed, and until the day that all who reject him and hate him and are doing these things that, that just seem like the everyday normal order of things now, until that is changed and removed, we will experience the curse. But on that day, there will be no more curse. All those things that destroy us, all those things that break our hearts, all those things that break God's heart, all that sin that we continuously say, oh, that's not sin, it will be gone. And we'll see, oh yes, it was sin. Jesus is coming. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. I believe I talked a little bit about this in the last video. That that means that Jesus Christ, God, our Father, the Holy Spirit, God, owns us. His ownership is no longer contested. His ownership is clear for the entire universe to behold. And there shall be no night there. And they need no candle nor light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. I want to go to heaven. I want to go to this place. I want to see it with my eyes. That's what Job said. Job said that I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand upon the earth in the latter days and I will see him with my own eyes. Though worms destroy this body, though this flesh dies, though this flesh is destroyed, I will see him with my own eyes. That's what the book of Job tells us. And he said unto me, 
These sayings are faithful and true, and the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show to his servants the things which must shortly be done. This is Jesus talking. Behold, I come quickly, and blessed is he that keeps the sayings of the prophecy of this book. And I, John, saw these things, and I heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel that showed me these things. Then he said to me, See that you do not do that, for I am your fellow servant, and of your brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the saying of this book, Worship God. And he says unto me, and he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of this prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of that city. For outside of it are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Though that former order of things that's passing away will never enter into this city. It will never enter into these gates. But you and I, if we trust him, if we walk with him, if we love him in this life, we shall be coming in and out of that gate, those gates. We shall be with him. He will lead us himself into that place of still water. The Lord, our shepherd. Oh, the tender love he has for us now. I am so looking forward to the time when all of the blinders are off. All the filters are removed. All the wrong-headedness that I have, all the misconceptions that I have about this God and His love and His grace and His power and His mercy and His dignity and His majesty, when all of that is removed and I am seeing Him and I'm able to see Him and I'm able to really grow more and more, that's what's going to be going on in this place called heaven. He made it possible for me to go there when he died on Calvary. And he proved that not only is it possible, but it's a fact when he rose from the dead. He is alive, and he's promised that as he lives, I shall live. And Jesus Christ right now is in this place. He's preparing for us a place. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. That's heaven. That is heaven. That is a place of joy. That is a place of purity. That is a place of goodness. And that is something that God is offering us. I want to go there. I want you to go there with me. I want you to see these things for yourself. Jesus said over and over, these things are faithful and true. God did not lie to us about heaven. God said that this place is real. And he said it so many times. And this is a, yet another reason why I take these things that I just read to you literally. Because God said over and over, these words are faithful and true. That's what it says here. It says, these sayings are faithful and true. The Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show to his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. Now that's everything else that was recorded in the book of Revelation. Those things that shall shortly come to pass. I've already been talking for quite a while and I've already read quite a bit. And any more is beyond the scope of what I wanted this video to be. Let us just suffice to say that all the events before Jesus comes back, before the setting up of his kingdom on earth, and before 
the making of heaven and earth anew. That's recorded in Daniel. It's recorded in Isaiah. It's recorded in Zechariah. It's hinted at and shadowed in the law itself. It's talked about in the Gospels. It's talked about in the book of 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. Peter talks about it. James talks about it. Jude talks about it. These things that God plainly tells us in his word are going to happen. and They're going to come to pass. But when all of that is said and done, there is this place called heaven. It's a place he is inviting us all to experience. He's inviting us all to come to him. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We are looking for that ultimate rest. And that ultimate rest is heaven with him. We can't have heaven without him. Because where he is not, is not going to be heaven. Therefore, we cannot have a heaven of our own making. We must have the heaven that he has promised. And we can only have that heaven through Jesus Christ. Why am I saying this? Because there's a lot of people in this world now that want to live without him. They say, we don't need Jesus. But somehow they think they're going to go to heaven anyway. Somehow they think <coughs> that there's some other place for them to go to after they die. They think that somehow they're going to be reincarnated and reincarnated and reincarnated until somehow they work themselves into some kind of perfection. And I'm not even talking about Hindus. I'm talking about just this crazy idea that people have that they can just make up whatever they want and it be so. The words that I read to you are faithful and true. And God sent his angel to show us we have the record of it here in the book of Revelation. Heaven is real. There have been a lot of books out lately about near-death experiences where people have claimed to have died and gone and seen things and heard things. And to be honest with you, I've read some of it, and I find some of it, I find some of it interesting. I find some of it um, maybe even possible. I don't know. I can't trust them, though. I can't trust a book written by someone that may or may not be, but I can trust that the Bible is telling me the truth because these words are faithful and true. And I know that they're faithful and true because Jesus Christ, the beginning and the end, the risen, resurrected Lord, proved that these things were true when he rose from the dead. Heaven, it's ours. All we have to do is ask him for it. All we have to do is believe him. All we have to do is allow him to give us the strength to live this life and walk with him. I want to go. In his time, in his way, sure. But it's more than the fact that he has put eternity in all of our hearts. And this is why all everybody wants to go to heaven. They don't want to die to get there. And some don't, eat, don't want Jesus. But they still want heaven. Well, God has put eternity into our hearts. And I'm longing for that eternity. But I have received that eternal life from Jesus Christ. And I want to invite you to accept it also. These things that I wrote, uh, that I read to you, they're true. It's real. It's not fantasy. It's not escapism. Maybe on some other video some other day I'll talk about the rapture. Maybe some other video some other day I'll talk about um, the tribulation, the futurist understanding of prophetic scripture and revelatory scripture. Maybe, maybe not. You can always come to my Sunday school class. That's what we're talking about now. But I just wanted to tell you a little bit about heaven. And the fact that I am excited. 
and I'm longing for it. And oh, I have a longing. I have such a longing to be with Jesus and to see him. And the great and glorious thing for me is that you can come with me. You see, my wife accepted Jesus Christ also. So I know she's going to be there. I know that my great-grandmother accepted Jesus Christ, Rebe Roberts. I always thought that was kind of a funny name. But my granny with her funny name is going to have a new name in heaven. The Bible tells us that he that overcomes will I give a white stone with a new name written thereon. That no man knows except he that receives the stone. So even granny with her funny name, Rebe, is going to be there. I want to see her too. I want to see you in heaven. I want to see you. And all you have to do is ask Jesus Christ into your heart to forgive you of your sins. All you have to do is believe him and walk with him. All you have to do is just turn your life over to him and live the life he empowers you to live. Salvation and obedience. There is no salvation without obedience. Obey him. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Obey him and turn to him.